As a Mercedes 600 turned 60, we revisit the history of this iconic car, boasting all manner of incredible stories about extraordinary passengers. The best of the best and the worst of the worst wanted this car, totally extremes. Among the famous owners of the 600, John Lennon, and Idi Amin, the infamous ruler of Uganda in the 1970s. It looks like the kind of car that somebody important should be driving. Hopes were among its most high-profile passengers. Austrian pop star Udo Jürgens, perhaps less so. It was all about status back then, right? But it was the, the epitome of opulence. And over the course of 60 years, the Mercedes 600 has become a star in its own right. The magnetism of the 600, it just has a presence that no other car has. There's nothing quite like a 600. And it was the best of the best on the luxury front. It's a sovereign feeling because it certainly was the best car in the world. Mercedes engineers reveled in the challenge of making the impossible possible. The engineers were told, design the car that you want, that you think is the best car in the world. And if you give German engineers a, kind of an open checkbook to design something, it's going to be special. It's a special car, so that makes you a special person. We met the man with an unrivaled familiarity with Mercedes 600 owners the world over. Peter Shellhammer delivered the high-end cars to their illustrious owners and also saw to repairs and maintenance work. And his job included organizing test drives for potential buyers, which in 1972 meant visiting the Shah of Iran. I met him and I convinced him that it is a good car. He said, your car must be better than a Rolls Royce, otherwise I don't, I don't want it, I'm not interested in it. I could convince him and at the end, I was successful because South Persia bought 17 of the 600s. He handed over Mercedes 600 keys to dozens of heads of state. In most cases, they were bulletproof versions. They only shake hands with you when they're satisfied with you. This was in 1968 when I delivered a car in Egypt to the president, Anwar El Sadat. The, uh, is, the speciality of his car was that the car was, was protected and his wish was to have movable windows on the rear because he was claustrophobia, had a feeling to be enclosed too much. And therefore he wanted to have the possibility fresh air. The Mercedes Museum in Stuttgart has one of the two five-ton bulletproof models used to ferry state guests in West Germany in the 60s and 70s. From Britain's Queen Elizabeth II to Leonid Brezhnev, leader of the Soviet Union. These distinguished figures weren't at the wheel themselves, of course. The back seats frequently became the scene of historic diplomatic talks. Mr. Brezhnev was sitting here, and uh, various other presidents. It's all the finest materials used in this car. And uh, it's, it's a homely feeling. It helped to uh, improve the uh, conversation, the atmosphere between the people. And on the eastern side of the Iron Curtain, the 600 again had some high-ranking customers like President Tito of Yugoslavia. The model belonging to Romanian dictator Nicolae Ceausescu is nowadays on show in a private vintage car collection. The one belonging to Enver Hoxha, the decades-long leader of Albania, is now slowly riding away in a garage in Tirana. A luxury Mercedes that everyone wanted. From legendary Cuban leader Fidel Castro to the founder of the People's Republic of China, Mao Zedong. For countless authoritarian rulers too, the Mercedes 600 was the ultimate set of wheels.
these people, they wanted always to have the biggest and the nicest and the newest products on the road. Money plays no role and therefore they say, ah, new car, Mercedes, I want this car as well. Iraq Saddam Hussein likewise owned a 600. And his love of the armored Mercedes model almost spelled doom for Peter Schellhammer. I was there for service purposes and uh, it just happened as it was in the 90s, in February 90, when, when the first uh, Gulf War broke out. But luckily enough, I was getting out in due time. Saddam Hussein's Mercedes 600 is now featured at the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles, a state limousine with a very particular set of extras. It's got all of these running boards all around the car so that his guards, I mean, there's running boards on the sides and on the back where I guess his bodyguards would stand. I would not have bought the car if it was Idi Amin or Saddam Hussein. I wouldn't feel comfortable. How would I ever drive a car that Idi Amin or, or Saddam Hussein drove? I think that having some sort of positive uh, provenance with it makes it better. So at least, you know, saying it's a Roy Orbison car, for some people that's meaningful. Which it certainly is for Barry Zonin, who bought one such model owned by Orbison in the 70s and 80s. A car that provided inspiration for some of the American rock balladeers' best-known song lyrics. Is that all right? And I was never all that fond of Roy Orbison. But what's funny is that now that I own the car, you know, um, if we're, there's no cassette in the car, there's no CD in the car, so I refuse to add any of those items. So I put a Bluetooth speaker in the back and I play Roy Orbison, and now I really like it. In fact, Roy Orbison only drove his beloved Mercedes on very special occasions. When he died in 1988, the car had a paltry 3,000 kilometers on the clock. I bought the car because, number one, because of its condition. You need to buy a car in really, really good condition that's been cared for. If you know the car, for instance, the pneumatic, the, 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 the four-gang switch for the pneumatic windows um, on the driver's side, that switch alone costs seventeen thousand dollars. If you if you if you if you're lucky enough to buy, find one new. Little wonder, given the engineering involved. The car is fitted with a comfort hydraulic system. That means any parts which wanted to be altered in its position is not electrically operated, but hydraulically. And from the driver's door, of course, you can operate all four door windows. And you, the idea is it is very quiet. There is no humming, there is no sound. And that silent running also applies to adjusting the seats. At the front. And the back. Every 600 has a different interior design, customized to the owner's individual whims and wishes. And it's only when you hit the road that you get a real feel for the car's luxury credentials. We have shock absorber adjustment. That means comfortable ride. We have soft adjustment. And when you drive it and you hit a bump, you, you, you know you've hit the bump because you can see it, but you don't feel it. It just floats. Um, it, it's like a boat. What it feels like to sit in those leather seats uh, with these great springs in them, cruising down the road, and um, you know, you just, you, you feel luxurious. And if you drive fast, you put it in position hard and you get more rigidity on the, on the wheels. The eight-cylinder 250 PS engine propels the 2.5-tonner to a top speed of 205 kilometers per hour, 
and with a chassis setup rivaling that of a top sports car. Twelve prototypes were built over the course of ten years before the final version was unveiled at the Frankfurt Motor Show in September 1963. The car went on sale to the public in three different versions. Between 1963 and 1981, Mercedes built 59 Londolette editions, featuring a convertible top and measuring 6 meters 24 long. Accompanied by 429 units of the regular Pullman limousine, likewise with the long wheelbase, and 2,189 sedans with a length of just over 5.5 meters. But all model variants had one thing in common, the extremely sophisticated engineering. V8, fuel injection, and in here we have the fuel injection pump in between the V of the engine. The constructors had the order to produce an outstanding technical, technological car and they were not limited as far as money is concerned. So that's why they could play a little bit around with their ideas. So they came to the air suspension with level control or adjustable shock absorbers. The total of all the innovations are, short, is, are extreme. The new modern vehicles, they have a lot of these innovations taken over. Eager to keep the technically complex cars running, fans across the world have teamed up to form national Mercedes 600 clubs. And then, of course, we have the support of spare parts and garages where the people can bring their cars, which is not very easy because uh, not too many people are able to work on the cars and uh, parts are limited. The German enthusiasts are in close contact with owners in the United States which, thanks also to social media, is home to the world's biggest 600 club. Among its members is Luis Pacheco. He's already taken a range of aging 600s and restored them to their former glory. Continuing what Mercedes did so many years ago, and keeping these cars alive and on the road, and I think that's what drives me to be a part of the club. I like the challenge and I fell in love as soon as I realized how complex the 600s were with the hydraulics and everybody in the club is a resource because everybody has connections. Mercedes 600 drivers in the United States are a close-knit community and meet up regularly at vintage car events. And that's where Barry Sonin has picked up priceless tips from former TV chat show host and car lover Jay Leno. Jay's out there. He's uh, he's a real car guy. You know, he's got his own garage with a tremendous collection of cars, including a 600. And he came up to me and talked to me, and and he says, you know, you gotta, you really have to bleed the 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 uh, the, the air tank because it gets water. And I said, oh, okay. And there he was. He got down on the ground, and I didn't want to get down on the ground, but Jay Leno's down there. I gotta be down there, right? So I get to come there with him. And he's showing me how to bleed the water out. You just kind of press this one button aside and it releases any of the water that's built up in the air compression system. What makes Barry Sonin's Mercedes special is the all black styling, as desired by Roy Orbison himself, known for his dark outfits and shades. But the singer wouldn't have bought the car had he not one day been given a ride in this light blue 600 in Tennessee, which belonged to Elvis Presley. Elvis had two of his own, and uh, yeah, and once he rode in Elvis's car, that was that, you know. And of course, they were both from Tennessee. They're both from that area, you know. And 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 Roy was a real aficionado of cars, you know. He just loved cars. And so did Elvis. And uh, yeah, after he drove in Elvis's, he says, "I have to have." One. The Mercedes 600 became a global phenomenon, a car emblazoned with a star for stars. This was the most expensive car you could buy, okay? So people who had, you know, unlimited amounts of money uh, and also uh, unlimited need for image. I mean, I don't know if the Beatles had one, um, that David Bowie had one, um, 
supposedly even Janis Joplin, you know, who had that famous song, Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? That was the car that inspired that song. She had taken a ride with some other rock star who had one. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drop A different kind of intoxicating trip for the music scene, but the clientele also included actors like Elizabeth Taylor, and fashion designer Coco Chanel. None could resist the charms of the 600, a truly eclectic mix of owners. From pop star peace activist John Lennon to Idi Amin. It looks like the kind of car that somebody important should be driving. So I don't know if the Beatles cared about looking important, but I think the world leaders wanted what they considered to be the best car of the time. John Lennon, he bought it because he could do it, right? He had that much money and for him, I think it was just, you know, he, he made it, right? He was successful and it was a great, comfortable car. But Idi Amin, I think it was more typical dictator, showing off, but both had made it in their realms, per se. For sure, the 600 attracted the best of the best and the worst of the worst. I don't know where I fit in that group, by the way. I don't know, I don't know which group I belong to. The Mercedes 600, the ultimate set of wheels for those seeking a bit of automotive majesty. The good, the bad, and the beautiful for presidents, pop culture icons, and popes. A German economic miracle, and a car that for some symbolizes an era in which nothing was impossible, and the likes of which we'll probably never see again. What do you think? Have your say in the comments.